Okay, if we could turn again in our Bibles, please, to the book of Judges in the third chapter now, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Judges chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, and we're going to be looking at the first judge this morning at Othniel, but we do have some leftover business from the introduction. I know there's six verses that deal with the introduction, and then we'll get to Othniel, but verse 1, it says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hivites and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chishan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Chushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Chushan Rishathaim, and the land had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. Just a couple of general observations about this chapter in general. First of all, uh, we'll notice that we're, we're introduced to the five lords of the Philistines. And then down in verse 25, uh, we also will see the king of Moab is called the Lord as well. Uh, you notice verse 25, they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore, they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. So we've got the lords of the Philistines. We've got the king of Moab considered to be the Lord. But then in this same chapter, we have the name of Jehovah God. Uh, in your King James Bible, it will be L-O-R-D capitalized. Uh, the word Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever, uh, but you'll find that uh, in this chapter, 14 times, the Lord is mentioned. And so the simple uh, kind of overview of the chapter is this, that although there may be these petty lords and rulers, but there's one Lord who is in control. And, I, I, and the overall message, really, of this chapter is, we're reminded who is really in charge, and it is the Lord. In fact, uh, these references to the Lord, L-O-R-D, capitalized uh, 14 times in the first 15 verses, we are introduced to the Lord, L-O-R-D, capitalized. And we, what we can see is that he executes his divine decrees. He doesn't violate human responsibility, but he does rule and overrule in the affairs of individuals and nations to accomplish his great purposes on the earth. Isn't that good to know, actually, today, when we look at what's going on in our world, the petty lords that are setting themselves up as, as tyrants in our day, and yet isn't it good to know that, that the Lord is the one who's in charge, and he rules over all, and he is uh, working his will out in this world for his glory, and we've got to keep coming back 
and reminding ourselves of this. Just recently, all the things going on in our world, I was just reminded in reading Revelation that the, the tribulation cannot, cannot begin until the Lamb opens the first seal. And so it's in his control, right? It's in the control of the lamb. He determines when that first seal will be opened, not a moment before, not a moment after. And so it's just good to know that the Lord is in control. And we're certainly going to see that, that he's even going to use the disobedience of the nation uh, to, to teach them uh, some important lessons. And so we're going to see in verse verses one through six, where we're going to see a kind of conclusion to the introduction. Remember, our chapter and verse divisions are not really inspired. Uh, they're helpful. We're glad they're there. Uh, but sometimes they're, they're put in the wrong place. And so this is really still part of the introduction that we saw in chapters one and chapter two. And it continues down to uh, chapter three, verse six. And it's to do with uh, the, the proving of Israel. And we, we already saw that in chapter 2, verse 22. It says that through them I may prove Israel, whether they'll keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. See it in chapter 3, verse 1. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Uh, verse 4, and they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken to the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And so there's a test going on. The Israel have been tested by these nations that they didn't, didn't drive out. They failed to drive them out. And so the Lord has left them there. But part of their purpose is to prove Israel, to prove their love and loyalty uh, in a pagan culture. And, and again, I really believe that, that you and I are being tested even today living in a pagan culture with all its temptations and with all of its difficulties and trials and all the rest of it, will we remain in love with the Lord and continue to show our loyalty to him despite the environment we find ourselves in? And that's what's going on. We're being tested. They're being tested. Uh, and they certainly, uh, sadly, weren't doing very well uh, in regards to these tests. So, we notice it says, now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel. It's kind of ironic that it says the Lord left. And yet we just saw in the previous chapter that they failed to drive out these nations. They weren't faithful in driving them out. So you could really say it was a combination of both their choices and God's will. They made these choices. They were wrong choices, but God still would use it for his glory and he would say, okay, I'm going to leave these nations, but I'm going to put them to a good purpose. And one of the purposes that they were left, uh, these nations, was for the purpose of teaching the nation how to fight. It says, notice again, verse 1, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many as of Israel as had not known all the wars of Cain and only that the generation of the children of Israel, verse 2, might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. So there's a purpose in all this. They're, they're left there to teach Israel war, to, to teach them how to fight, to train them, to help this new generation who had not known the, the wars of Canaan's, uh, Canaan, the meaning of war. And, of course, we need to recognize that we're in a war. Uh, we need to be ready for war. We need to, uh, we need to let people know that, that once you accept Christ as Savior, uh, you've entered into a war zone. And it is a battle. Uh, the Christian life has been well said. We're not on a cruise ship. We're on a battleship. <laughs> and we're, we're in a conflict. And it's the conflict of the ages. And God is looking for warriors, not wimps. That's a challenge to all of us. Am I a warrior for God? Or am I a wimp? And uh, maybe that's not a, a nice word to use, but, but am I a softy? Or am I somebody who's up for the battle, ready for war? And the Lord wants to teach us to do battle. And we, we are in a conflict and we need to know. So the Canaanite presence in the land, it, 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 it had dual purposes. 
Uh, one was it was to teach them war, and another was to stop the land from being overrun by wild animals. If they had destroyed them all at first and they had not had chance to kind of really uh, kind of get the land established, they may well have been overrun by wild animals. And if you look at Exodus 23, uh, you will notice the Lord mentions this in verse 29 and 30. It says, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. By little and little, I'll drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. So again, there were multiple purposes in the Lord's will here in allowing them to stay. Now, of course, we know uh, it, it all works for good, right? God, you, everything works for good uh, for those that, that love God. And so these nations are not left in Israel for the purpose of enslaving Israel. Just like the flesh is not left in us that we should serve its lusts, but it's left in us that we also might learn by war the love of God's heart the strength of his arm, and that he can make our enemies work his purpose of grace. The very fact that we have the flesh still within us, it, it causes us to be more dependent on the Lord, right? On a daily basis. I realize today uh, I have an, in, an enemy within my own flesh, and I have to be dependent on the Lord. And so the Lord has left it for a purpose, a good purpose, uh, and it's to see my love and loyalty to him. It's to teach me about conflict and war. It's to teach me dependence upon him. It's not that God couldn't have destroyed these pagan nations without the help of Israel. Uh, we know that from Sodom and Gomorrah. If he wanted to, he could have wiped them out instantaneously, right? God can do what he wants to do, but he left them there for a purpose, to test them, to prove them. And so he, he would do several things. He would prove, he would use this to prove if Israel were faithful to him, but he would also use it to improve their reliance upon him. And so, again, God doesn't instantly change every area of our lives so that our relationship with him can be proved and improved so that we live a life of true partnership, true dependence on the Lord. And sometimes, you know, we, we get weary of the battle and we get weary of the flesh. And yet, I think it's good if we can recognize it's there for a reason. It's there so that I might cleave more dependently upon the Lord for daily victory. And so I'm walking in partnership with him to live a life that's pleasing to him. Also, so these generations might be warriors for God. He wanted them to learn conflict. And of course, there's a, there's a practical reason for that. That Israel was surrounded by hostile enemies. So even if they had have defeated the Canaanites, they're still surrounded by hostile nations. And of course, throughout their history, that's been the case. Uh, they're, 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 they're in this very hostile environment. They've got, for many of their early years, these petty little kingdoms that surrounded her, uh, you know, the, the Edomites, the Moabites, all these different nations, uh, the Philistines. And then not only are they surrounded by hostility, eventually in their later stages, uh, there would be uh, other nations like Assyria and Babylon and Persia and Greece and, and Egypt. And we know that so often these nations would fight each other. And guess where most of their fighting took place? Uh, Syria and Assyria in the north would come down through the land of Israel to Egypt in the south. And so constantly, humanly speaking, Israel was in a place, strategic location, but a place where she was constantly sur surrounded by enemies. And if she was to survive, she would have to learn war. And it's still to, it's true to this day, isn't it? Uh, last time I was in Israel, uh, one thing you see is the military is everywhere. And young girls, as well as young men, they're in the military and they have to do their service. Everybody has to do their service. And it's just a requirement. And, and so they're, they're in this conflict zone. And so they have to learn war. 
none of us really like fighting. Uh, if we're really honest, uh, most of us don't have uh, any particular desire for conflict. I was talking to a brother recently, and there's some difficulty in the assembly, and he, he needs to go and lovingly confront somebody. And he said to me, he said, Mike, I hate conflict. And that's good, isn't it? It's good that we don't like it, that we don't like confronting people. We don't like, none of us like that. But again, we have to learn that we're in a war. There's a struggle against sin, uh, and uh, the battle is good for us. Uh, it, it does teach us dependence on the Lord. The symbol of Christianity is a cross, not a feather bed, <laughs> right? It's about war. It's about conflict. And so he names the enemies. He says, namely, the five laws of the Philistines. It's interesting how he mentions the Philistines first, because ultimately, as we progress in Judges, and then we go, as we've already done in 1 Samuel, we're going to see that really the major uh, conflict uh, for years would be against the Philistines right into the very reign of David. Uh, and so the Philistines would always be like this thorn in the side. And then, of course, there's the Canaanites, those that were still left in the land, the Sidonians, you know, Tyre and Sidon on the coast, uh, a little bit north of Israel. And then the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon. So again, just north of Israel, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entering in of Hamath. And so he names the enemies. God named each of the pagan peoples uh, that stubbornly stayed in the land and that would be Israel's enemies. And again, it's good for us to know our enemies. Uh, it's good for us to know what personally what our enemies are. Uh, what are where are our weaknesses? What are the areas the enemy wants to attack us? And, and to be able to name them and to be able to know them, because Paul could say, 2 Corinthians 2.11, he would say this, we are not ignorant of his devices. And we can't be ignorant of the enemy. One of the, the important aspects of warfare is intelligence. It's knowing your enemy, knowing his strengths, knowing his weaknesses, knowing uh, his capabilities. And so God names them, and he, and he says, these are the enemies that are left behind. And it's important for us to know who our enemies are. In fact, I think one of the things the book of Judges will do for us, it will help us to understand our enemies and understand how they work. It's going to be very helpful in learning about spiritual warfare. And certainly we cannot afford to be ignorant of his devices. So verse four says, and they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken to the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And we said it's the test of loyalty. Uh, are they going to listen to God and his word that had been given through Moses? Are they going to cleave to the word of God? Are they going to be in obedience to the word of God? Or are they going to, as it were, uh, give in to the enemies and their philosophies and their ideas. And so, again, and I believe the battle today for the heart of men is begins in the mind. In a sense, it's a battle for the heart and the affections, but it begins in the mind. All these philosophies of men, and again, our, our children, uh, if they go to secular education, third level, uh, not just third level, nowadays, even in kindergarten, it doesn't make any difference, but they're going to be bombarded by the enemy's ideas. Are they going to swallow them or are they going to embrace the word of God and believe God? And this is the, the great battle that is going on today. And it's the battle of the ages. And so it tells us, uh, it's to prove Israel. Are they going to obey the commandments that were given by Moses? And verse five and six are very sad verses. And there's a progression in these verses that we need to observe before we look at the verses individually. I want to give you the kind of progression in verse five and six. So let me just read them and then I'll point out the progression. So it says, the children of Israel dwell among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. That's, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. And it's pretty clear, isn't it? There's a threefold progression. It begins when they settle down among their pagan neighbors. 
instead of driving them out, which was what they should have done uh, and had no mercy on them, they settled down and lived amongst them. And so they got comfortable. And that's, I believe, the first generation. Uh, the first generation, they settled down with their pagan neighbors. But then this generation had children. And what happened to their children? Well, because their parents had not been separate from these nations and had hobnobbed with them and interacted with them and all the rest of it, well, their children got to know the children of these pagan nations. Well, they're not too bad. This one, boy, she's a good looker and all the rest of it. And before you know where they are, it says that they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons. Now we've got a second generation. First generation settled down, second generation intermarried. And then this second generation, because you got to keep the wife happy, right? You know the saying, happy wife, happy life. And so it says that they married these pagan wives. And then it says they served their gods. And so we see a tragic progression. And now... Israel, a nation that were supposed to be separate, supposed to dwell alone, not only were intermarried with pagans, but they were worshipping the pagan deities. And so it all begins with settling down amongst them. Are we comfortable in the world? Are we settled down in the world? Are we imbibing the philosophies of the world? How much time do we spend listening to the world's philosophies on the media, whether it would be the regular media, social media, it could be good for some time for you just to log how much time is spent being bombarded with the philosophy of the world versus how much time is spent in the word of God, in the things of God. And the more settled we are, the more likely we are to, to eventually uh, even become intermarried with the world. Now, God wants separation. Separation from evil is fundamental to Christian victory. Now, not isolation. The Lord Jesus was the most separated man that ever walked this earth. He was fully separated to the Lord, but he wasn't isolated. But, but he never was influenced by the world's ways. His heart was fully separated to his father's will. And so we're not talking about isolation, but we are talking about separation, separation from evil in its philosophies, ideas, its conduct, and separation to the Lord in love and devotion to him, his will, his word, living with his values in view. And once there's that loss of separation, and it begins inwardly in the heart before it ever appears outwardly in the conduct. Once I lose that separation in my heart of devotion to the Lord, pretty soon it will manifest itself outwardly in my associations, in what I'm involved with, and ultimately in what I begin to allow. And so it tells us that there was an intermarriage. They took their daughters to be their wives, gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. They married outside of the will of God. And it wasn't too long before they embraced the worship of their partners and abandoned totally, even all pretense of devotion to the Lord. It, it, and of course, when marriage takes place outside of the will of God, it always leads to compromise. Uh, it, the importance of scripture is that we're to only marry in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39 makes it very, very clear uh, that we're to marry in the Lord. And that's vital. And, and let me just say this, that marrying in the Lord is, it's not just good enough to say, well, she's a Christian. I don't think that's sufficient. There are many a, a man being taken away from assembly fellowship who married a Christian girl, but she had no heart for God's assembly. She had no heart for God's principles and God's truth. And yeah, we're thankful. That's good that she married a Christian, but, but is it a Christian of like precious faith? Is it somebody who has the same appreciation 
of the things that delight the heart of God. And, uh, and of course, it's possible, as we well know, to be somebody who is truly a Christian, but living for the world and the world's values. And so uh, after getting saved, if a person is to be married, the next most important decision a person makes after salvation is who my life partner will be. It's going to have a tr- profound effect on the direction a person's life will go. Let's just, I want you just to see this. This is the word of God. This is what God says, and he says it over and over and over again, just so we don't miss it. And so let's go back to Genesis, because it's always good to go back to the book of beginnings. Genesis 24 and verse 3. I recently did a wedding, and uh, uh, I spoke on Genesis 24 uh, in terms of giving the the marriage sermon, I guess. And it says, verse 3, I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Abraham, the father of the faithful, as we call him, he did not want his son to marry someone from the Canaanites. Uh, He was concerned about this influence of the unequal yoke back in Genesis. Genesis 26, verse 34 and 35. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashemeth, the daughter of Elam, the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. How much grief has been brought to the people of God when their offspring have married from people of a pagan background or people who have no heart for the things of God. Chapter 27 and verse 46, and Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? In other words, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because you don't really have real communion, real fellowship. You're not on the same page. And uh, these daughters of Heth were a great wearisomeness to Rebecca. She was just wearied by them. Book of Exodus now, please. And chapter 34, Exodus 34, verse 15 and 16. Exodus, Exodus 34, 15 and 16. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice to their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. And so again, we see uh, this constant warning in the word of God. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, these, uh, the second law given to those who are about to go into the land of Canaan, but with all the subsequent warnings and pleadings of Moses. And he says in verse 3, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy, thy daughter uh, thou shalt not give to his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. And so we have this warning. And of course, the New Testament is equally consistent, isn't it? When it talks about be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We've already covered it in Second corinthians chapter six and of course the most noble example that's brought before us in scripture would be that of solomon in first kings chapter 11 and a man who had such wisdom but one area where he really lacked wisdom was in the area of choice of life partners (laughs) plural in his case but it tells us in first kings 11 but king solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, 
and Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after the gods, after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And of course, verse nine, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And of course, why? It was because of these women that turned his heart from God. So we mentioned that in Judges, we're going to learn about warfare and we're going to learn about our enemies. I want to mention that really the first three enemies that are mentioned in terms of these kings that brought them into bondage really are a picture of our great enemies. The first one who in our opening reading, we've mentioned a few times uh, this man, Cushan Rishathaim. Cushan Rishathaim is a picture of the world. Because if you remember, he's from Mesopotamia. Now, where did Abraham come from? Well, he was in Ur of the Chaldees, which is in Mesopotamia. And God called him out of it. It's like a picture of God calling us out of the world, right? And now what's happened is in Cushion Rishathaim, bringing the people back into slavery, into bondage, we'll see that in a moment, that the world that they had left behind through Abraham had now gradually come back and captivated them and gripped them. And so it's a picture, or he is a picture of the world coming into our lives even after we've been delivered from it. And isn't it amazing? You get saved and it's kind of radical and you're done with the world. And you, But if we're not careful, slowly but surely, worldly values can creep back in and we can find ourselves embracing things once that we had left behind in our zeal and separation to the Lord. And of course, um, the world is no friend to grace. Remember that lovely hymn, is this vile world a friend to grace to lead me on to God? And we saw when we studied the Gospel of John on that, uh, that cross in, in uh, Hebrew uh, and, and Greek and Latin, uh, showing that the world had no love for the Son of God. The religious world in the form of Hebrew, the Jews, the the cultural world in in the Greek language, and then the political world in the Latin language. And so what we would say is this, that this world, this whole world system is set up in defiance against God in every respect. Is this vile world a friend to grace to lead me on to God? And so Cushion Rishathaim represents that great enemy of the Christian, the world. And then Eglon, as we'll see, this is a, a guy who uh, needs to go on a, a, a high-protein diet, I suspect. Remember, he's, he's the exceedingly fat man, and he pictures the ugliness of the flesh, the second great enemy of the Christian. And then the third one is Jabin. And we're going to look at these in detail, but Jabin is, represents the prince of the power of the air because he, he's a king over a host. Uh, he's got a host under him, just like our enemy has principalities and powers and rulers of darkness under him. And so he pictures our enemy, the prince of the power of the air. And these spiritually are the enemies we must fight in our experience as believers, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so we need to learn the lessons, vital lessons from these circumstances. So we find the children of Israel, they're intermarried, they're serving their gods, separation has completely broken down. And verse seven says, and now we enter into the judgeship of Othniel. And it says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Now, I want to just make some remark on the groves. Groves was a place of worship of the goddess Asherah or Ashtaroth. 
Um, and it was um, interesting that these groves, one of the symbols of, of Ashura uh, was a sacred tree. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 16, Deuteronomy 16, in verse 21, Deuteronomy 16, 21, it says, Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set up thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. So whenever you hear reference to the groves, it was a place of worship, and it was connected to the worship, worship of Asherah or Ashtaroth. And remember, we've, we've learned a little bit about her. Uh, she she was the, the, the consort or wife of Baal. Uh, she's connected with fertility. Uh, she's also known as the queen of heaven in Jeremiah. And often th these uh, groves were right next to Baal's altar because, you know, they're husband and wife. And so we see it, for instance, in Judges chapter, chapter six, where you have the groves mentioned or uh, right next to uh, the altar of Baal. In the case of Gideon, it says, verse 21, uh, sorry, verse 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. I find it an interesting thing that the worship of this queen of heaven, Ashtaroth, is connected with a sacred tree. And can you not see echoes of Eden? You remember the Garden of Eden and the sacred tree, the tree of life? They were banished from it. And you can see that even in pagan worship, there's this element of truth there. there there's a little bit of truth because a lot of lies connected with it. But here we have a sacred tree and, of course, connected with a woman. That takes us back to Genesis as well. And so there's some echoes of Eden here. And, and um, these high places, because they usually were built on high ground, these groves, became a regular feature of Israelite worship. And only the most godly of kings tried to eradicate the groves. In fact, sadly, even Solomon himself worshipped in some of these high places. But look at, and perhaps one of the reasons people left them there is because they were associated with Solomon. But look at Second Chronicles chapter 17. And verse 6, and this is godly King Jehoshaphat. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. And so here's a king who's serious about dealing with this kind of worship. And again, remember how appealing this kind of worship is to the flesh, uh, because of course it's all to do with fertility and all that goes along with it, great immorality connected with it. And so the children of Israel, they served Balaam in the groves. Then it says in verse 8, therefore... And again, we always recognize when we look at scripture, why is the therefore, therefore? In the light of their conduct, it says the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, against his own people. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rithatham, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishatham eight years. Jehovah is angry with his people. But even in that, there's hope for Israel. Because what it tells us is this, that he will not allow Israel to serve Baal unmolested. He's going to step in. His wrath is an evidence of his holy, jealous love for his people, which in which he refuses to allow them to continue in that direction, he steps in. He refuses to allow his people to remain comfortable in sin. Steadfast love pursues them in their iniquity and is not in, above inflicting misery on them in order 
to awaken them. You see, the way of the transgressor is hard. And one of the, the evidences of God's love is his chastening hand upon his people. C.H. Spurgeon said this, God never allows his people to sin successfully. Their sin will either destroy them or it will invite the chastening hand of God. If the history of Israel teaches us anything, it teaches us this, that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And the Lord certainly will discipline his erring children because he loves them too much to allow them to continue in this condition. And so here comes the, God's instrument of chastening. And it's this man, Cushan Rishathaim. And kind of an interesting name. Cush, as we know uh, from Genesis, it, it means black. And then Rishathaim means double wickedness. Now, it might have been a nickname. Uh, you know, his, his real name is Cushan, and he's nicknamed double wickedness because of his behavior. He was a doubly wicked man. And he's from Mesopotamia, which means double rivers, two rivers. Uh, Mesopotamia is where the Tigris and the, and the Euphrates come together. And so here's double trouble from double river, <laughs> double evil from double river. And the blackness, Kush, we said means black. So you've got this idea of the blackness of double evil. And notice it tells us very clearly here, it was the Lord that sold them. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cush and Rishathaim. Very interesting. The idea of the word sold here is the idea of sold as slaves. He had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, but now he sells them back into slavery. And they're sold into slavery to this man, the blackness of double wickedness. They did evil. They forgot the Lord. They became slaves to the idolatry that surrounded them. Therefore, God dealt with them like slaves. So it's a very much an abiding principle, isn't it, in Scripture? What a man sows, that shall he also reap if he sows to the flesh of the flesh he will reap corruption and it's a principle isn't it a, a tragic thing really these people are sold into slavery and yet they continued in that condition for eight years before they cry out to the lord it says they served cush and rishathaim eight years eight years before they realized their true position they came under an alien influence for eight years. How much did they miss of enjoyment of the land in those eight years when they were enslaved? Sometimes it takes a long time for a person to realize the bondage they're in and get to the point where they're so sick of it that they actually cry out to the Lord. Why we don't recognize it quicker? Well, it's just the stubbornness of the heart of man. But sometimes we're in this condition where we're robbed of real enjoyment of our inheritance. And we live like that. We live like slaves for a long time because all sin, anybody who sins, the Lord Jesus said, is the servant of sin. It's, it's enslaving. And we live enslaved lives. And, and sometimes for years before we get so sick of it that we cry out. But here's the good news. The moment they cried out, the Lord raised up a deliverer. And the Lord is just waiting to hear the cries of his people. When they're tired, when they're sick of their bondage, he, he's just waiting to hear the cry of his child saying, Lord, I'm done, enough. I cry, well, please bring me out of this. I'm in, I'm in slavery, I want to be free. And of course, we know New Testament language, if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Christ is the great liberator, and he wants to make his children free, to enjoy the liberty of the sons of God, 
rather than to be in bondage and in slavery to sin. And so it says in verse 9, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So after eight long years of bondage, they finally cry out in dependence on God. If I might just take us just for one moment to the book of Romans. I find Romans 7 a marvelous chapter. I find it a marvelous chapter because it brings man to this place, Romans 7, 24, and it's a beautiful place because it's just like what we've seen in chapter 3, verse 8, that after years of bondage, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And here's this, this man, a Christian man, who wants to do the right thing, but he's enslaved by his passions. And he cries out, oh, and what a cry. He cries out and he says, oh, wretched man that I am. And notice what he says, who? It's not what program, <laughs> you know, uh, what new methodology. He's looking for someone outside of himself. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death and then i thank god through jesus christ our lord who's the deliverer jesus christ our lord and he delivered him and by the way if this one man got free who cried out to god you can be free too whatever it is that you're enslaved to, cry out in desperation admit you're the wretched man and cry out to the Lord. And it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then he goes on, verse 2 of chapter 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And he entered into that glorious victory. And so in this verse of chapter 3, verse 9, and it's a lovely verse, really, because it just it tells us, that when we cry out to the Lord, he's ready and willing to deliver us from our bondage, whatever it might be. And so it, it's, um, it's amazing how it's, it's, the, it's the place we need to be, but it's the hardest thing to do. We like to talk about the problem. We like to talk to others about the problem. Uh, why do you think Christian counseling is such a big deal today? Why are seminaries uh, massive courses on Christian counseling? Because, because we want to talk about our problem, but we don't want to talk to the one person who can really set us free, and that's the Lord. Or be done with man's ideas and, man's, uh, and talking to men and worldly ideas. Cry out to God. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Cry out in desperation. Cry out in fervency, and the Lord will bring deliverance. Now, we've already met Othniel in chapter 1, and we've learned that he was a, a man who was a separated man. He, draw, he destroyed Kurjeth Hefer. Remember the city of the books. It was the depository of Canaanite philosophy. He wasn't interested in in adopting Canaan philosophy. In fact, he destroyed the very city where all the books were kept. And so he's a man, he said, I have no time for the philosophy of the Canaanites of the world. And he changed the name to Debir, which means oracle. His interest was in the word of God, the oracles of God, thus saith the Lord. That's what captivated him. And unlike the old children of Israel who were unequally yoked, well, Othniel married in the Lord, didn't he? He, he? he Remember, he married Aksa. He married Caleb's beautiful daughter. And he didn't just marry somebody because she was part of the children of Israel, of the tribe of Judah. No, no, he married Aksa because not only she was a beautiful woman, but she was a woman that, that had spiritual ambition. Uh, she wanted the, 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 the upper waters and, and, the, and the lower springs. Uh, she, she, she was anxious to, to enjoy her inheritance and to, to enjoy the fullness of her inheritance. And so he married this woman with spiritual ambition. He was the very opposite of what we read in verse 6, where they took their daughters and all the rest of it. And he is more akin uh, 
to the truth. Chapter 1, verse 13, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Axa, his daughter, to wife. And then notice it says in verse 10, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war and the Lord delivered Cush and Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand and his hand prevailed against Cush and Rishathaim. This is the first reference to the spirit of the Lord coming upon one of the judges. But as you would imagine, it's used seven times in the book of Judges. It's here. For the first time, chapter 3, verse 10, and then look at chapter 6 and verse 34. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. Chapter 11, verse 29. Judges 11, verse 29. The spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead. Uh, Chapter 13, verse 25. 13 verse 25 and it says the spirit of the lord began to move him that's samson at times in the camp of dan and uh, chapter 14 verse 6 and the spirit of the lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid and then uh, chapter 4 verse 19 the spirit of the lord came upon him and he went down to ashkelon Uh, chapter 15 verse 14 the spirit of the lord came and when he came to lehi the philistines shouted against him and the spirit of the lord came mightily upon him and so what we might say is this that the success of the judges was this that they learned the lesson of zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 not by might nor by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And we could say this, the Holy Spirit longs to reveal to you the deeper things of God. He's the one that leads us into all truth. He longs to love through you. Remember the love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost that was given to us. He longs to work through you. Through the blessed Holy Spirit, you might have strength for every duty, wisdom for every problem. Comfort in every sorrow, joy in his overflowing service. Oh, how we need to recognize our need of the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. Othniel represents the kind of man God can raise up. He had a good wife. His affections were in the right place. And he was a disciplined man. He had to wait eight years until Israel cried out before God used him. He had to wait for the people of God to get exercised about their condition. He couldn't help them until they saw they needed help. And he had to wait patiently, just like Caleb had waited patiently for 40 years. A great factor in God's servants is they have to be patient. And patience is so hard. But never underestimate the good that one person can do who is filled with the spirit of God and obedient to the will of God. And so it says the land had rest 40 years. You notice that they were in bondage for eight years, but the land had rest 40 years. Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Eight years in bondage, 40 years in freedom and liberty. All the days of Othniel, and it says Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And we'll see what goes on next. But one thing we need to observe is that oftentimes, once they were delivered, they experienced 40 years from the Lord of rest. Chapter 5, verse 31, sometimes even 80 years. So let all the enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love be him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might and the land had rest 40 years chapter 8 and verse 28 it says thus was midian subdued before the children of israel and so that they lifted up their heads no more and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of gideon so what we can see is uh There's bondage, 
But then when we cry out to the Lord, we can truly enter in to his rest. Oh, what a place that is. May God encourage us to be like Othniel, to be obedient, to depend on the Spirit of God, and to believe God for help for the people of God in these difficult days. For his name's sake. Amen.